Awesome. We're really excited to be here. Uh, and we're deathbeds. Uh, we use notebooks every day. Uh, it's kind of been a part of our friendship for a really, really long time. So we're super excited to give this talk to you all today because what we're thinking is that some of the ways that we use the notebook might be ways that people use them in the future. So we're going to get kind of weird today. Uh, before we get going, we have a blog. And it's up on uh, GitHub. If you guys haven't tried this before, if you have your own username on GitHub, you can make something called yourusername.github.io. Make a branch called, or make a repo called that on your repo and push your stuff to it. Now you too can have a website. Ours, however, redirects to NBViewer, because we love Jupyter. Um, and over here, we can look at what the, what the actual readme is inside of there. Um, we are a coding collective that values data and testing, documentation, scientific method, laws of thermo thermodynamics, and just making the best entropy that you can. If you're making the same stuff as other people, it's probably not interesting. So we're trying to do a little bit of stuff new. So anybody who gets upset, sorry. Um, but uh, we use notebooks every day, and we're trying to focus on them being readable by humans and computers, right? It's not just about the code working. It's about other people being able to use them in the future. Um, so. Right. Uh, and the kind of the highest goal that we, we, we try to achieve with our notebooks is that they're computational essays. Um, it's a great post on here. I don't know if it actually made it into there in the end, but uh, Stephen Wolfram has a wonderful document, piece of document about uh, sort of his guiding vision around what led to Mathematica, one of the antecedents of, um, of the Jupiter ecosystem. And the computational essay is you know, this critical piece in humans and computers. Uh, and it's going to answer a, a lot of different roles in the, in the future. So before we continue, a huge congratulations to Project Jupiter. Right? Winning the ACM award is huge. Anybody who's in the room, congratulations to you all. Like, that's amazing. Right? Uh, but a small people, number of people were affected by actually receiving the award. Um, at large, congratulations to you all, right? Having good taste and choosing a piece of technology that's going to stand the test of time, uh, just as a bunch of these uh, technologies that have won in the past have, right? Right. So anybody that's, uh, that's been up this game, uh, Unix, we're all using something somewhere on our person, probably right now, that's, that's derived from one of those systems. Uh, the Alto anticipated many of the things that we're seeing today in, in terms of interactivity. Um, Postscript, Ingress, uh, TCP IP, you're talking it. Uh, the, the World Wide Web, the first browser for it, uh, all these things were totally critical in our ability to provide the level of interactive computing that Jupyter can do today. So the technology that we chose is right, right? Like we can use databases and we can use Linux and we can use the command line. We have all of these things and like a catch-all that won the award, right? Like the big net for cool computer science stuff. Um, but yeah, we made the right bet, but moving forward, right? Like we're developing technologies for today, but what do the technologies of the future actually look like? Um, you know, who are the future users? How will life be different if these pieces of computer science are actually critical infrastructure to what people are doing on a daily basis? How's that going to change things? So what do you think the future users are going to do, man? Oh, I don't know. I mean, they're going to change the world. Great. They're going to literally change the world around them. It's exciting to watch, especially being at this conference. There's so many folks doing so, right? Um, so, you know, Jupyter Hub and Jupyter, it's going to connect people and communities with their data and their compute. Um, it's amazing. Personally, it makes me feel like I'm a reporter from the, uh, from the Daily Prophet. Why aren't those? Yeah, there they are. You know, it kind of makes me feel a little bit like a... Like I can actually, uh, you know, make these documents that move. And moreover, oh no, Nick. What's up? Oh no. Control. We didn't restart and run all. No. Don't How do we not restart? All. Okay, we got to move faster anyway. Um, cool. So we're moving. So, you know, GitHub's a graveyard. There's 250 million notebooks on there, and it's continuing to grow. Two million notebooks on there. Two million notebooks. There will be 250 million, don't I think you think? You're probably right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, is our network barfing? That's very plausible, because cool. Restart Run All does make it load about 1,000 iframes. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. great. Sick. So uh, talk about the diverse. OK. Um, so as we're the, uh, you know, our, our insights into it come from some of the data that we have already gathered. In 2016, we did a, uh, a survey of all the, the, the Jupyter users that deigned to reply. And we saw that uh, the, the user counts were starting to move outside of uh, traditional hard sciences and mathematics. Um, we're starting to see a really broad swath of different um, uh, different disciplines, and this definitely bears to be one of those things that we we revisit in the future. I think Jupiter definitely needs to do a better job of gathering more data about the things that we're doing. 
And notebooks are showing up in journalism. We have this one uh, article that's got some crazy statements by Stephen Wolfram, but you know, it's fire, right? Um, and then we're seeing it in the LIGO presentation this morning and warming oceans. Uh, all these things are hosted on NB Viewer. So what is, this, what is this curve that we're riding? Why is this happening? How are notebooks actually doing something to people's minds such that they want to share them and such that other people want to read these notebooks and reuse them? So Fernando, I mean, a lot of this jur journalism stuff, like it, it was told before that journal data journalism, journalism and the notebooks will collide. This is not a surprise, right? We've been set up for this for a while. Um, so we're thinking about this idea of literate computing, literate programming, journalism, readability, uh, computability, and that's what Deathbeds is. It's our collaboration. Because we needed something that wasn't already domain squatted by a bunch of other things. And so uh, we have a few tenants. We, we shared some of them a little bit earlier, but uh, what we want to talk about today is notebooks as the basis for uh, creatively exploring your future literacy, right? Uh, what will these users of the future, what will it mean, mean for them to read what other people are writing and to write the new things themselves. And all of our notebooks are importable as modules. So they're not only readable, but they're reusable as code without changing them to Python. So import MB is the project that's going to enable a lot of this. And it's in the deathbeds organization. And you can see if we imp we're actually um, importing some code here and running some code. And you can see that the source is actually um, uh, IPYNB files. And, uh, with that, uh, we're going to kind of jump, we're going to skip ahead here. But some of our inspirations are up there. You can go and check them out afterwards. So moving on to the next segment, we're talking more about what, what is this literacy? What is the definition of this literacy that we're actually going to be encountering? Um, so the, uh, what? Oh, he's doing things. He's doing things. Okay. Good, man. Great. There we go. OK. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a quote inside of a quote inside of a quote. We have a couple of these from Annette V. She's definitely worth a read uh, if you have the chance. But um, uh, you know, paraphrasing, we're, we're basically controlling our languages. And luckily, as computer scientists and, and users of computers, we definitely understand that language is, is a pliable concept. Uh, and we're going to do some really bizarre things with that today. Great. So there's, a few, there's, there's three literacies, and I kind of want to align them to something that everybody knows. Uh, we're going to talk about markdown as being a textual literacy, code as being a computational literacy, and notebooks at large as being a procedural literacy. How do you take things and put them together? Um, and we can, see, like, we can see how a lot of histories and influences have really gotten us here. If we look at computer programming for everybody, which is Guido's uh, DARPA proposal, we can see that we, they compare it as a mass ability to read and write. Code has become that important. The need to compute, the need to read, the need to write code, all of these things are being contemporary, could becoming contemporary and modern problems. But really understanding how this, th this stuff actually works is not as important as understanding that it works. And that's procedural literacy. If you do this thing, and you do the next thing, and you do the next thing, you're going to get this result. And this is the most important part of the, literous, the, the literal concept. What can we make computable without having to understand how the Intel x86 architecture works, how TCP IP works? And Jupyter is doing an incredible amount of work in that regard, I think. So another opinion that we take on top of that is we write markdown first. We write, docu we write code that people are going to read. And one of the ways that we, we have this, we, again, this is one of our posts. Um, but uh, if we were to you know, just kind of consider the simple case here of print, and we show print, if I were to tab this, if I were to turn this into markdown and run that, it just prints. But just a simple tab kind of converts the idea of my cells from being Markdown to code versus on and off, right? So this is a weird thing that you're going to see in our code. I apologize to anybody who doesn't like it. Um. So this, uh, this wonderful blushing young man here uh, is Donald Muth. Um, uh, a great read out there is uh, the, the infinite layers of yak shade that, that he performed in order to arrive at the book of the century and develop the language and all that. Anyhow, so LaTeX was one of the big uh, uh, motivators for the notebook, is the ability to communicate in a scientific manner. And this ability to be multi-language uh, from the get-go has uh, really helped us understand what it is we're trying to build and for whom. But basically what he said is don't write code that people can't read. Right. Right? Like, yeah. that's just not nice. It's, just <laughs> it's very <laughs> considered and selfish. It's true. So uh, we're going to combine literacy, and we're going to kind of make this argument that, like, 
replicability or reusability, one of the key features that's missing is readability. If we wrote more readable documents for humans, then perhaps it would be easier for, those to, for them to reuse those things. So we have markdown and code and notebooks, textual, computational, and procedural literacies. But now we have this readable, reproducible, reusable aspect. And Gall has a great article about it, but we're not going to touch on it. Uh, Mostly because the background's black. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, go. So, uh, so what does it actually mean to be readable? And how can we apply that to code and not just, you know, did you write proper English? Um, and we, what? Wow. Uh, okay. the, I, I, I'm a good fan. Keep going. Yeah, all right. So, uh, you know, what we, what we want to look at here is, uh, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the types of conventions that we can introduce that help make uh, the product that we're creating better? Python has these suggestions. And readability counts. Yes. And then Zen of NumPy, Zen of SimPy. There's all these ideas around um, how we can program better. But like when we're writing literate documents, it's, it's computer programs have style guides. Computer programmers have idioms. So it's really hard to marry the way that we write code with the way that we write. We have to change a little bit. And the new users are going to help us do that. Uh, like black is the only color. Uh, anybody use the black formatter? Yeah, there you go. yeah. There you go. This is like really bad code to black in. But if you write bad code, we've got this cool little magic here that's just going to go and like replace your code all sweet, right? So you know, don't worry about code formatting. Have somebody else do it. You're a person, not a machine. That's right. Um, uh, and and uh, Paco was very nice to, to give us a few uh, shouts out this morning. But uh, this is one of his talks that he gave at Jupiter Day Atlanta not too long ago. Um, and we uh, uh, really in encourage you to check out uh, Paco Nathan's talk about Oriel. Um, one of the key things in there is what we think is probably one of the first presented style guides for the notebook. Yeah. Um, there, there wasn't really anything that told you what to do in a notebook before this. And, right. and they, they actually had a really well-defined criteria for it. And the, the, two that we really, the re two that we really leaned into was, number one, focus on a concise unit of thought, because that sounds a lot like unit testing. Right, so if we can write unit testing like things in the notebook, then maybe more people can write tests because everybody wants more tests, right? Um, and then the other thing is restart and run all or it didn't happen. We've kind of changed, changed that phrase, but if you want to make a readable and reusable document, everything better execute because a human reads the same way as a computer. If they don't understand what you wrote, they get an exception. It's just that it didn't show up in the terminal. Um, but this, this restartability allows your ideas to persist longer. Right. Uh, and that persistence really takes its form in a, in a number of different ways. Um, that is a lot of emoji. Uh, so the, the accessibility of your, of your content to uh, different kinds of computers, different kinds of people, different kinds of robots, I don't know, whatever it is that we're going to be communicating with in the future. Um, so start to build, those, build that prowess now and work in other languages that you don't know. Learn about new kernels. Try new things. Uh, <laughs> like try new things from the internet, like 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 import this module that gives you TQDM. Uh, oh, it's not pl playing noise. It, there it is. Yeah. So what if your TQDM played some sound and you walked away from the computer and you knew when it was done? This is just a notebook that's on GitHub that we're in. <laughs> is it done? Yeah, it's done. Oh, thank God. <laughs> You did a better one that plays MIDI. It's wonderful. Uh, All right, it's, that's it's, not the weirdest it's gotten, though, man. It's no, about to get way not. weirder. It's not. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> has anybody ever heard the, the term the medium of the message? Marshall McLuhan. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, what we want to talk about is is how this this format of the notebook will have will have had been uh, changing how users think about their data in the world around them. Um, so the uh, uh, we, we come back to the computational essays, and uh, we're not going to, uh, what, what, what do you got going on? I'm having an argument. Gotcha. OK. All right, great. So um, uh, I got to click. There we go. Great. OK, so we use notebooks for computational essays. Computational essays are just saying we're combining code and text together. But the way that we write these things is we write them as little pieces of code that we might copy and paste, like all data scientists work. Um, we write them as modules. We write them as tests so that they can be reused in different ways, because you never know how somebody wants to test your, your technology. Oh, man. Oh, that's fine. We can go over here and then back up. The, where did I put that reload at? I don't know. Did you duck something at the beginning? I'm not, I'm not. Oh, it was uh, when we did black in. Sorry. 
Oh, yeah. that's right. Right? So Watch out for set next there, input. It's a beautiful piece of technology, but it is very dangerous. So again, this is a test, right? Like, this is an example of how having bad code in a notebook, like if you left that in the notebook, right, your code wouldn't work and you never would have known it. So in some way or another, having these tests lets us validate these things. Maybe that was a, I don't know if that was a good example or a bad example. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so now we're going to get into it. So we're going to map this idea of uh, literacy over to um, usage. So in terms of literacy as a, oh, Nick, I'm stuck in your, in your jive thing. Oh, no, you're stuck in an iframe. Great. What am I doing in okay. So we have input, we have compute, and we have output. So we're going to mess with each of these things during the talk. Okay, we're going to show you some cool places in IPython that you can do some fun stuff. Uh, in order to build this environment, we crafted up uh, a number of extensions here. Um, uh, not, none of them are on the scale, probably, the other things, but uh, Deathbeds did actually make a lot of weird stuff here. Um, we're using widgets, because you've got to use widgets, because everyone loves widgets. Uh, some first-party JupyterLab things, like this cool status bar down here. I don't know if I can hover on it. Oh, I can. Look at that. It's cool. We added that yesterday because we were so impressed. With the yeah, we saw it at the poster stuff. session. We thought it was sick. I don't know who, if anybody in the room did that, but it was cool. Yeah, good, good yeah, job, thank too. You. And, uh, and then a bunch of cool uh, widget stuff from the internet. So the first thing we're going to do is experiment with imports. And uh, does everybody know about get IPython? Does everybody know about this object here? Uh, it, when you're running a notebook in Python, you get this IPython object, and it has all of this cool stuff on here, like an input transformer or an ask transformer, being able to set next input. So you can really change the way that you experience word processing in the notebook by modifying these things. And you can enforce, you can force these things on your future users. It's great. So we've got some examples where we're doing some like graphs and Which what one? else is there? Just scroll up a smidge because scroll that's up. too. Or no, wrong way. Yeah. So we got some examples oh, here. Yeah, yeah, that wrong way. Uh, yeah. So we got some short. So we got some emojis in code because who wouldn't want that, right? Like as if JavaScript wasn't bad enough. Let's uh, let's put some emojis in our code. Um, and uh, we also have these. Uh, like, what if you could write Markdown in a code cell? Uh, so if we import these things here, uh, and we reload the extension, and now we are writing Markdown code. Potentially. Print. So yeah, this, that example didn't work. Bad example. Anyway, move on. Um, darn. Are you hitting buttons? No, I'm not touching anything, man. OK. Cool. Uh, oh, this was the example, wasn't it? Never mind. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so another thing that we do is with this input transformer, we can actually hack on the live state of our running kernel. Right? So we can actually go and make magics and test our magics out directly in the notebook. So if you add a function that has def load IPython extension, then your notebooks and posts and programs all become reusable that way. Um, and another way we were thinking about inputs was um, what if, so on deathbeds, uh, we have all the lines of code rolled into our completer. So what if you could? Um, look at all of the imports that you might have made in the past, and then just go be able to grab them, right? Like, what if you could find your stuff easier? What if you wrote code and wrote Markdown in a way that, yeah, maybe I'd want to go and reuse that, perhaps? And what it might just lead you to do is it's going to make you more of what you are. If you write really bad imports, it's going to help you write more bad imports. Yeah. Uh, if you do lots of import stars, you're going to keep writing import stars. But it helps put you those things in perspective, right? You don't have to go back and search through things. You don't have to go read your notebooks. You're continuously having them reinforce the things that you're doing. It's really important when you're doing it for yourself, but when you're doing it on a team, you can actually imagine uh, how this can raise the scale of, of your work. Right, like everybody's got their own style with a notebook, but in order to work in a team, there has to be some kind of agreement. And we really think that this idea of testing notebooks, rerunning them often, restart and run all, it imposes better methods, like ideas like caching and shorter code and more compact ideas. And ultimately, we can use these as tests and improve the longevity of our code, uh, protect it from changes in the future, and add value to you and the customer. That's right. So uh, we're going to walk a little bit through uh, some useful ways to use notebooks as tests, as we feel that. Uh, uh, that's the kind of thing people are going to actually want to do a lot of stuff with their data in the future. Is it true? Um, are the things that we're doing uh, the truth? Um, the simplest form by far is doc test. Uh, this is available to you inside of, uh, um, did you run the, what did, what did, this sucks. That worked. Okay. That worked. That work. 
I don't know. Sir, come on. You, you're missing the tech there. Oh, come on. There we go. There you go. There you go. Okay. So, hey, look, at a doc test and it worked. Yeah. Um, so doc test costs you very, very little. Uh, it's just three greater than signs and they're accessing the notebook inside of you don't have to use under import. It's, uh, it's a little bit weird actually. Um, so, you know, import doc test test mod. And uh, these are demos, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, but that's gonna start to give you this, this confidence while you're running your notebook. And if it's in part of a restart run all state, it's just gonna work. So you notice there's this little condition if name equals main. Basically we're designing our API backwards. Instead of writing our Python program and saying, hey, this is what main's gonna do, we're gonna say, hey, this is what main should start doing, and then we can kind of incrementally build it out. So if this is loaded as a module, or we would notice that uh, the name wouldn't be main. So while we're in the notebook, we can kind of like modulate between this restart and run all state and the imported reusable state. Right. Um, so PyTest, uh, you know, I think most of the, the Jupyter projects at this point have now transitioned from Nose, God bless you, Nose, um, over to PyTest. <laughs> PyTest is super ultra modern and it does even crazier things than we do to your, your, uh, your ask and whatnot. Um, but uh, it has a lot of important concepts like uh, first class fixtures and runners and parameterization that make fantastic things happen. Um, if so your notebooks are importable, they can be those tests. So again, we've been just sh really showing stuff that we're thinking about, right? Like these things are not much code, but they allow us to go back and look at our ideas later on and potentially build something more sophisticated afterwards. Right now, the target was making a presentation, so we wanted to make some cool stuff, so we put together this hodgepodge here. And we've got this fun little example of uh, interactive type checking where uh, if we go and run this, uh, everything's great. And uh, if uh, we change uh, anything about this, uh, actually, we'll re rerun this one here. So this is a matrix multiplication problem, and we get an interactive type error because uh, the y expects uh, the shape to be 4 uh, and 2, but it wasn't. So if we know these things, uh, I don't think static type checking makes a lot of sense in interactive computing because you have so much stateful information that why not just be able to potentially infer it from a running notebook? And now, now, now the same function works, and it's been type checked. Fantastic. You're going to try the drawing up here? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, no, no, let's not, not, let's not worry okay. about it. So uh, uh, kind of the, one of the next places we've gone is, uh, is, is kind of bridging the, the physical and the digital world. Um, so what we're interested in is, is being able to take in art and the M show, there it is, um, and end up with data off of the art. Um, we can go the other way and we can use data to guide art uh, by using uh, the ability to project light with a projector um, and then creating things off of that. Um, so this guy, you can't really see it, but uh, those were widget controlled sign curves that then became the visual grid uh, oh, yeah, and we like use Unicode thing. names for our variables because they look right. It looks more like math. It's prettier. Um, yeah, cool. So we, outputs. Number one, NB Viewer is the main form for output, right? We also, are, are, some of these notebooks will run on binder on both reincarnation and deathbeds. Uh, so have a look at our blog sometime. And then, Nick, do it. I know oh, you're no. so stoked. Oh, no. I'll run it for you. OK. Uh, so one of the places that I've, uh, uh, oh, OK. You done? Running. You done? It's running? You run it? I don't it? know. You run it. What? Okay. I'm Sorry. Mine right. wasn't working. I'm running it. Cool. I'm not sure what it's doing. Is it collapsed? Uh, the, the input's right above the cell. You can see it. The input's right above the cell. The input number. Do we have to restart? Oh, let's restart and run all. Let's restart and run all. Great. Okay. So this is cat. Okay. Yeah. Escape. This isn't working over here, man. Oh. Got it. Oh. I'm on it. Okay. So this is CAD in the notebook working with widgets, right? Like, uh, 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 the, the scenario should have popped up a little bit quicker, a little bit rough around the edges. We're putting a lot of stuff in here. Um, but, you know, a lot of people program in CAD, right? Like, a lot of people are going to come in different, from different places, different syntaxes, you know, whether it's Photoshop or whether it's animation or whether it's video, and they're all going to come and they're going to do weird things like this eventually. Um, He's hanging on somebody. Come on, baby. What? Oh, you're, I, I'm, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Well, let's just continue along and see if we can get through. All those iframes. Iframes are crack. All right. Um, so anyhow, yeah, it's, uh, 
It made it this far. All right, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how we change whatever you're doing. Let's keep going. We can bring that one up later. Yeah, well, just yeah, we'll keep going. All right. Uh, so this is a widget, hopefully. Yeah. Cool. So one of the things that we've gotten into recently is being able to. Um, uh, we, we, we put our um, images onto um, uh, as GitHub issues. Um, and then, uh, can you scroll up a little bit, man? Yep. So we put our, our images on issues, and then we kind of have these little widgets that sort of let us explore them and see what's in there. But if you have images, just put them in an issue next to your project. Like, it's really reasonable, especially when you're putting together these documents. What if our outputs were more interactive? Uh, we got a, our whole presentation broke, man. It's all right. I'm not going to blame Microsoft, but I might blame Microsoft. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. We're good. What if all? Uh, what if our uh, outputs were a little bit more interactive? So in this example, in this post, we're actually thinking: What if you had some, had some markdown, um, and you had inline code in it, and then that inline code was augmented with the displays. Like, what if you knew what was in the globals at a specific time? What if you knew what your pandas data frame looked like? How could we use this code and literate composition? Oh, we have way more time left than I thought we, we have did. We a lot of time. That's not too bad. We we'll can do, do some, we can do the CAD we'll demo. That yeah, that's super great. That's super great. Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, we're going to swap over to your machine. But Nick made this thing. So, so this thing, um, we're going to, so what if, what if you could run Jupyter Lab in the browser, right? What if you could just open up Jupyter Lab and start writing TypeScript and writing Python and be writing CoffeeScript? Do you or what if you could open up something that could also get inside of uh, your running Jupyter Lab that had <laughs> access to all the things that Jupyter Lab can do? Um, then you could look at documentation, and you could maybe somehow tear documentation out of the thing. You I can't get rid of it now, um, but uh, so I, and I, yeah, there's really no way to get rid of it. But then you, yeah, you, you can. Oh, I just made another one. Oh no. Oh, oh, this is entirely too much. You need some extra CSS in order to make it work. But oh, I just made another doc. Panel. <laughs> Well, what if I, well, it's good. Let's get the other thing set okay, up. We, we've got more stuff to show, man. But yeah, right. So like, this is how close. This is what a what a mess works going to be in the future. Is you're going to have everybody be like, let me do this thing. Um, so another thing that's happening. Has anybody heard of the robot framework? Testing framework. Yeah. Well, you, you learned about it yesterday too. Oh, okay. Did did you tell Nick about it? You can say yes. Okay. Oh, all right. Fair enough. He's been telling everybody about Robot. Robot's a testing framework for Python that just makes it super easy to spin up Selenium and write uh, behavior-driven development tests and stuff like that. So in this example here, um, we actually can go, is it in kernels? One. Kernels. Oh. Kernels. And then we can look at the test results. Uh, there is, is it where, four? four? OK. So in the for loop, uh, we're testing all the kernels. Uh, verifying all the, uh, that they all work in the browser. Where's the images? Cool. And they're also taking screenshots for us, right? So we can be developing this application in JavaScript, taking screenshots and making sure that everything's OK. So hey, hell yeah. Swap me over, because yours is cool too. But we can show them that, that you drew me this like really cool. Uh, oh darn it! Of course, the pen, it, it, that, that restart thing. No, it's not my pen's fault. But let's uh, let's go here and let's do a new uh, what is it? New literally canvas, new canvas. And now imagine like being able to just sort of you know take notes. Oh, the pen's just busted. Sorry guys. That's it. Anyway, 
let's wrap it. Get to that last slide and maybe let's wrap it. Which slide? Uh, the last slide in two, in yours. You, oh, here we go. No, shit. Oh, oh, I didn't have the tool. Oh, that was the problem. I'm a tool. That's the problem. Oh, see. But anyway, yeah. We have these nice things, and we can actually do it in the notebook, right? So there's some interesting, like we're thinking that people might not be using the keyboard as much anymore, perhaps. Um, we really thank you guys for observing this train wreck. Um, <laughs> it's been super fun. Uh, we like doing weird stuff and being weird. Um, but please check out Deathbeds. I know everything is bad on there, but some of it's actually good. We really appreciate editorial. And you know, anybody has anything that they don't know where it really belongs, Send it our way. We'd love to. We'd love, love to help you pull pull, pull a story, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think we did okay. Check out MV Viewer. Check out Travis. I think we have time for some questions. Oh yeah. What do we write? Restart and run all and write notebooks. That's what we're leaving with here. I want everybody to write notebooks. So we're showing you that you can be really weird with notebooks. This is a permission to go and do that thing that somebody said is dumb. Make a PR to deathbeds. We'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. What are we at on time for uh, questions? Four minutes. We just have the 10 minute mark. The 10 minute mark? Well, look at that. That's amazing. Please, anything. Ask us anything. Doesn't have sure anything to do with it. So that gets recorded. Sure. Sure. Um, all right. So it's not directly related to what you're talking about, but I'm Good. Really It's a really so, good question. It isn't? is. That's all, I love that question. I will talk about this all day until I'm, 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 I'm dying dead. Um, so notebooks and mobile, yes, uh, but. Um, so the nice thing about mobile and the nice thing about um, uh, uh, the, the uh, reactive and uh, responsive design, um, a lot of those frameworks, uh, what you actually bring along with that is not just mobile, but also accessibility. Um, and when you're also targeting smaller screen sizes, that's just more honest, right? Not everybody has 1024, whatever, giant things. So uh, there's definitely gonna be a role. Now, will it be an entire IDE experience? No, but we need to start building the muscle for being able to do these things in a modular way that we can get to that application. Um, I would see accessibility as the, as the, the, the thing we need to hit hardest first, um, but uh, I give that demo with the Jive offline stuff on my phone. Yeah. And it works. So uh, I, I personally believe that Classic is better for mobile. Jupyter Classic is way better for mobile because it's bootstrap. Um, but at the same time, like a lot of people are entering the workforce who don't know much about software to the point where they just learned on Jupyter and they just learned Anaconda. So now they go into a company and they really don't have the ability to put that stuff together. So I think a lot of people are going to be running Jupyter Hub, and I think that the major success of Jupyter Hub comes when there's actually a really good user interface for mobile interaction with Jupyter Hub because you don't necessarily need Jupyter Hub if you have a laptop. So right. you know there's a really nice place and a really large population of people that could benefit benefit from mobile forward Jupyter Hub. Right. For example, one of the first places that might land might be the single user, multi-user collaboration. So we were just throwing, we were just spraying QR codes all over the screen. Um, think about that more in the mindset of, thank you, in the, in the mindset of that QR code now gives me a portal into interacting with that kernel. It's not just that iframe. I now have this new interface for it. Great for presentations, great for interacting with a classroom full of people. So it'll definitely have a role, but it might not be, man, I'm going to go throw down on some data frames. You know, it, it might be, I'm going to do some widgets, and I'm going to use my camera, and I'm going to use the, the accelerometer. Um, so more, not, not just different, I think is the thing. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you can demo them. I mean, you can you can prototype them, right? Uh, it's it's actually very hard to write TypeScript um, uh, in the way that I implemented the TypeScript kernel. So uh, yeah, language server protocol, just throw the whole language server in there. Oh! Um, but uh, yeah, I think there will get to a point where you should be able to write a single notebook extension that we can install. I, that, that's, a, that, that's why I started going down that road with Phosphor and everything. Um, should you do it today? No, no, but. Once everybody starts writing notebook, like actually yeah. writing notebooks in other languages, it then really becomes possible, right? Yeah, yeah. I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah, sir. So there's been like a lot of, So I, I, I don't think we're doing literate programming. Okay. Uh, I, I really take Fernando's definition that we're doing literate computing, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, the tangle and weaving used to be a thing that a program did, but now the human has some intervention there. So I think there's like a little bit more resolution into the process of literate programming by considering an activity of literate computing. When you say literate programming, you expect some style conventions, but when you're thinking about the coding, the coding part is more idiomatic in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Cool. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Hey, great job, man.